Good afternoon. Welcome to today's SCA webinar with Eric Carlson on the Dog Canyon and Persimmon Gap Thrust Faulting. Before we start today's webinar, we'd like to ask a few questions about the demographics of our audience. So I'm going to launch some polling questions. The first question is, what is your primary discipline? So it looks like we have petroleum engineers and geoscientists in our audience today, uh, some petrophysicists. Most of you have voted. Uh, so I'm gonna close the poll and share the results. Looks like we have 83% geoscientists and a small representation among the petroleum engineers and the petrophysicists. So let's go to our second polling question. How many years of full-time experience do you have in the upstream oil and gas industry? Quite a few of you have over 30 years of experience. And uh, I'm gonna close the poll and share the results. 54% have over 30 years experience. And then 31% are you are in the 11 to 20 year range uh, with some representation in other areas as well. So let me go ahead and close that. And then I'm going to share uh, some opening slides here. And before I introduce Eric, I'd like to remind the audience that you are muted, but you can ask questions during the presentation using the GoToWebinar question feature. We'll call, cover the Q&A at the end of the presentation and you will be anonymous. So this is today's presentation on Dog Canyon and Persimmon Gap Thrust Faulting. So this relates to the Big Bend field trip that Eric teaches for SCA. And you can see Eric has a long uh, career in the oil and gas industry and he has worked for a number of um, independents and also for Marathon Oil, has had a lot of success in drilling wells in basins in uh, North and South America. And he's gonna share with us some of his expertise about uh, thrust faulting. Uh, you can see he's worked in a number of different uh, geographical settings and geological settings and uh, has had quite a bit of experience in well logging. So the field trip that Eric leads for SCA is called the Big Bend Field Trip. And it's uh, usually set up in-house, so it can be uh, customizable if you would like to add to it uh, to make it a little longer and add some specific topics. It's a great way to introduce non-engineers or non-geoscientists uh, to these topics such as engineers, landmen, managers, and give them a chance to see the geology at scale. And uh, of course you can contact SCA to set up this training. Contact information is listed there. And uh, our next webinar uh, scheduled for June will be drilling down the interpretation, exploring the impact of geosteering methods on data analytics presented by Lacey Knight. So registration is open for that now, June 9th. And of course, turn to SCA for all your needs with respect to training, consulting, uh, direct hire and staffing and projects and studies. And so I'm going to turn over the presentation rights to Eric and uh, let you share your screen, Eric. All right, thank you. Uh, do I need to show my screen? Yes, you do. Okay. There now we go. see it. Great. All right. Great. Well, thanks for joining us again. I want to thank SCA for allowing me to give you the uh, we give you the opportunity to learn what I've seen out here. It's an amazing place, Big Bend. I want to say something about our title, Dog Canyon and Persimmon Gap, first. Uh, many of you have heard of the famous outlaws, Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid. Wherever you go, they're always called that. They're never called 
Sundance Kid and Butch Cassidy. Well, Dog Canyon and Persimmon Gap just sounds better. But we're actually going to look at Persimmon Gap first. Persimmon Gap is the Sundance Kid here, and Dog Canyon is the Butch Cassidy, if you will. So we're going to start with Persimmon Gap. We're going to examine Cretaceous and Paleozoic thrust faults at Persimmon Gap. And we'll discuss the stratigraphy and how rock types influence folds and thrusts. Now, this is very important, this first stop. It's the only place in North America where, with one view, you can see evidence of the two major mountain building events in the United States, that being the Laramide Rocky Mountain events, and that was uh, in the last 100 million years, mostly the last 80 million years, and then also the Appalachian style folding and thrusting. And I say folding and thrusting because in a lot of places, in addition to the thrust folding, we associate with uh, the Rocky Mountains and these low angle thrust faults. In the Appalachians, we do have some thrust folding, but we also have a lot of folding. And so that happened, of course, most people put the collision of Gondwana, that being South America and Africa, and uh, North America, part of Laurasia. They put that in the Mississippi, Mississippian to Pennsylvanian time, but I'm just going to call it Paleozoic because it occurred over quite a while. I'm going to take a look at both those mountain building events, and just very quickly looking at this slide, we can see a Cretaceous thrust here. We have a knuckle. Uh, if these are fingers, this is a Glen Rose formation. It's a lower Cretaceous Glen Rose formation. And it looks like he skinned his knuckle maybe right there. Thanks to erosion, we get to see through that. But we're also going to look in here. And there's another event that runs where my little cross hedge thing goes like that. And we have nearly flat rocks over not quite over some pretty high angle bedding here and that is a thrust fault from mississippian time over rocks that were already folded and faulted <laughs> and then finally of course the cretaceous went ahead and folded those around into a knuckle too so that's going to be a very interesting time by the time we look at the stratigraphy too maybe half the talk or more will be about that then we'll come down here to the Dog Canyon area, and this is on a trail right at the entrance to Dog Canyon. We'll examine the overturned anticline above the Cretaceous thrust, and we'll also look in strike and dip views because when we get into the canyon, we can actually see across it. So we have this giant, we have this giant knuckle here. We're going to be looking at this portion of the knuckle on the southwest side of the Santiago Mountains, on the south side uh, here. And that's what we're looking at in this cross section here. We're gonna see evidence to confirm that this is an overturned anticline, beds that make Vs. And we'll play a little game later today, U or V. Meanwhile, we'll finish up this talk by looking at some productive thrusted structures and overturned anticlines on seismic lines and how to map them. And I gotta tell you, like uh, Sundance and, and Butch, we're gonna go down to Bolivia at the end of this talk. <laughs> I think I saw a movie like that once where they went down to Bolivia at the end of the movie. We went down to Bolivia, but I gotta tell you something, we were wanted down there. I was wanted down there when Dan Morrison and I went to Bolivia, we were wanted, but not by the police. We were wanted by the uh, Bolivian Oil Company because a friend of ours leaked to them in 2001 that, in fact, I had figured out they were using the wrong drilling fluid in the basin that Bolivia and Paraguay is in, the Chaco Basin. They were using uh, uh, freshwater fluids in Devonian shales. Well, I said, hey, you know, there's a way to simplify correct that, use a different drilling fluid. And in just three years time, they cut the time it took them to drill a well, still with roller cone bits in half. So by the time we got there, they were very receptive to our requests. 
And so we got a lot of data. Uh, it's in my personal library now, and uh, a lot of it's in the public domain too. We're gonna come back now to an orientation. You'll recall that from Dar Spearing's book, and Dar's book is one of the course selections for this course, this great book, uh, Roadside Geology of Texas. It has more than just Big Ben in it, but it's a great place to read about the things you see in Texas as you're driving along the roads. Put out by Mountain Press, great book. Uh, Dar has this location map of Texas, and the area of the map at the right is the Big Bend area found in this green box. There's a scale bar for you to help you. Here's the map itself. Last time we were down here in Santa Elena Canyon. This time we'll be at the north entrance to the park, way up here at Persimmon Gap and Dog Canyon. And we will see uh, this Santiago mountain range. We're gonna look at this in some detail. We'll be inside it, if you will, at Persimmon Gap. And then to get to Dog Canyon, we'll walk around the south end and then get to the very southeast end of it. So that's gonna be, that's gonna be where we're going there. Importantly, the Cretaceous thrusts strike northwest to southeast. These things are striking this direction, but they're verging southwest. However, the Paleozoic thrusts, they strike southwest northeast and verge northwest. So in this part of Texas, the, uh, the South America hit, North America hit Texas, uh, and the, the vergence was Northwest. From another book that courtesy of TCU Press will be included as one of our guidebooks, a uh, uh, great book by uh, William McLeod, third edition here, that's the one I'm using. Uh, and they have also got great figures and pictures in there and good explanations. He's especially good for the uh, Cretaceous and Younger. We have another map of hers, his, which is just a, a terrain map, just an elevation map. Orange is more than 3,200 feet. Green is less than 3,200 feet, less than about 1,000 meters. Last time we were over here at uh, Santa Elena Canyon, that was on the western side of these sunken blocks that were due to volcanism. And a lot of the faulting in this uh, neogene faulting here is associated with collapse of these sunken blocks. And you'll recall that whole story of the boo-boo on the basketball. Uh, you can go back and watch that webinar if you wanna see that. But we're over here in Persimmon Cap and Dog Canyon. We're looking at Cretaceous thrusting, quite a bit older than the volcanism and also then paleozoic thrusting that's uh guys brace yourself close to uh close to 270 million years before the volcanism so these two areas much older structures here's a geologic map once again from mcleod page 40. the park outline again shown in this blue area that's the park boundary we're up here at the north entrance dog canyon about five miles southeast of that north entrance station all right so here's the uh, slide that was shown for the advertisement for this and i gotta tell you something i just come clean right now i thought i understood this and then i went ahead and got ready to teach it and you always learn something much more thoroughly and better when you teach it and so I had uh, on the advertisement called this little space, uh, called the second figure of the knuckle. I called it Devonian, it's actually Ordovician. The Maravius formation is, is Ordovician in age. My apologies to you for that. The rest of it's pretty close. Um, Lower Cretaceous Glen Rose and unconformity between, in this area, Ordovician to uh, Lower Cretaceous. The Paleozoic Thrust Fault, cuts across the bedding in the Mississippian. And in fact, it was a Mississippian strata that uh, that thrust fault did its flat portion, that flat portion of the thrust fault. We'll look at the upper uh, Cretaceous pen formation, nice plastic layer. 
And so one for which you can actually pass a thrust fault for many miles across it. I'm gonna introduce two other terms to you. One is the hanging wall, which is above the thrust fault and the foot wall, which is below the thrust fault. Looking at the stratigraphy really quick, some of it will be familiar from the last lecture and some of it will be new. You'll recall that the Glen Rose Formation is a uh, shelf limestone and most of what we'll see in the lower Cretaceous is that formation. However, it turns out there was also uh, a, a very early thrust fault before that big one. And, and that thrust fault right near Dog Canyon put the Santa Elena formation exposed. And that Santa Elena, you'll recall, is quite a bit cleaner and blockier, is not as shaly as the Glen Rose. I'm not going to go through these uh, analogs for age right now. Uh, the only depositional analog in producing fields I'll mention to you besides the Bolivian Chaco, which we'll actually look at some of those rocks, is there is uh, something equivalent to the Cabayas Novaculite. It is called that perhaps at Pinion Field in, in Pecos County between Fort Stockton and Marathon. This is a, a bunch of thrust faulting. Uh, in that case, of course, the thrust faults are uh, verging north again and north a little bit west. They've developed that into a field, pinion field. Oxy's had that for a while. So that's one that is directly from this Cavias evaculite. Underneath uh, this, so this Mississippian to Ordovician is a new section for our webinars. The Mississippian, sandstone, turbidites, shale, lime, and there's more turbidites, more sandstone in general in the upper portion. That's called the Tesnus formation. And then the Cabayas Novaculate, my favorite rock in the entire Big Bend area. And then the Maravius formation below it is black and white chert, lime, marl, and shale. All these rocks were deposited below wave base, most of them in a deep ocean between that existed between uh, South America and Texas, or if you will, between Gondwana and Laurasia. So for the most part, they, with the single exception of uh, the Novaculite, for the most part, they are they have a lot of organic matter in them. Here's a 3D view from over the ranger station or a little northwest, looking at our hiking route. So we're looking due east, and we can see the Cretaceous verging thrusts. They are in these uh, red dashes. And the Paleozoic thrust, actually remember, it verges northwest, uh, but the surface of that thrust fault puts Ordovician with southeast dip over Mississippian with southeast dip just north of the canyon. And within the canyon, uh, because of this, with, within our hiking route area, within our, because of this huge uh, thrust fault here, things get, some of the bedding gets upside down. It's very interesting. We're gonna start at the ranger station, walk 50 yards north of that, and take uh, about a one and a half mile hike up here and uh, see what we can see. We'll start with the upper Cretaceous bed and some paternal aluminum, and we'll come up, we'll pass this buried, in this location buried thrust fault, and come up to the back Cabayas and Cabayas Novaculite and finish up at the uh, in the Maravillas in the church. Once again, the scale here, uh, this is 330 feet at the Ranger Station, but that's 330 feet at the Novaculite. Respective view. From the trailhead itself, thanks to Google, uh, thanks to Google from the trailhead itself, we will see the Cretaceous thrust fault from the trailhead, the hanging wall and the foot wall. We'll see the unconformity between the Glen Rose and the underlying Ordovician. We'll see some Miss Mississippian back here. We'll walk and walk into the Cabayos Novaculite. Our trailhead elevation is, is almost 2,900 feet. Back here, the Novaculite is right at, uh, it's right about 2,900 feet. So it's a pretty easy hike, guys. I think you can do this hike. 
Oh, by the way, here's my chance to show a graphic. If you look west from the trailhead, not only will you see the knuckle that I just showed you, we can look across and see the knuckle on the other side of the highway that represents the south verging Cretaceous thrust. So here is the thrust plane, the hanging wall, the foot wall. Here's the Glen Rose, it comes around like this. So if you can put your head inside this, this structure, it will be, I'm looking southwest. Here is the, uh, here is Persimmon Peak. And here is the peak in the current slide over here on the right. It's just like that. So you can get in between it, walk around in between it, and then we'll walk around this peak like that. All right, going on, we'll take this trail and see this big structure, this knuckle as we walk around it. And we'll even get behind it so we can look up into it. I wanna show you my photographer, Richard Acosta. He helped me take these pictures for this webinar. We will see Mississippian beds that are steeply eastward dipping. We will see my favorite rock, the Navaculites. Really a lot of fractures. This is one of the most brittle rocks in the park. And here we go, we're gonna put a Cretaceous thrust fault into it and turn all sorts of directions on those fractures. And that's why that bias doesn't seem to weather along bedding planes or near it because it's just been really fractured. We'll also be able to see the Maravius formation in outcrop. So we're gonna take a look at these hand samples and where we are, but before we get to that, I just have to tell you a little bit more about the Paleozoic thrusting. Once again, uh, South America hit into Texas from the south and southeast. So it was over here, North America was over here. It's quite a while ago, Pennsylvania is a long time ago. When we look at this map, here is where we find it. The map at the right is, is just northeast of the Big Bend map. Here's Highway 385 coming down from Marathon and the park boundary in Persimmon Gap. Here's the thrust fault. Persimmon Gap's about the base of that S. So these maps are, are lying adjacent to each other, this one and the early map of Big Ben location. I showed you the second slide. We'll see that in this area, a series of Paleozoic thrusts strike southwest to northeast. That's the map view. Here's the cross-section view. This was by Dar Spearing, but it was made from cross-sections that are included in another guidebook, Big Bend of the Rio Grande, that uh, when Ross Maxwell, many years the park superintendent, opened the park, he put some cross-sections in from Mr. King from the 30s, famous geologist uh, that mapped all over West Texas. And so in my estimation, looking at this cross-section of, of DARS, this is about a two to one vertical exaggeration. Keep that in mind, I'm gonna show you some seismic later that's also at a two to one vertical exaggeration in Bolivia. So, but that's that's a good cross section. There's one other thing I'm gonna go here for the, the Permian rocks. Well, this is my chance to advertise. These glass mountains here, these Permian rocks here, guys, this is the wolf camp. This is the type section of the wolf camp. The uh, name of the ranch is the Leonard Ranch for Leonardian age and in fact, there's a place on that ranch called the Wolf Camp. So if you ever take my field trip and come down from Fort Stockton down to Marathon, we're gonna pass these 2000 foot cliffs of Wolf Camp formation that so many people have done work in. So ask for a webinar on that. Meanwhile, here are the thrust faults. We're gonna take a look at the Cabias formation now uh, found in the this color here, this, this straight cross hatch like that, horizontal cross hatch. So the Cabias formation will come up to the surface and will make tightly folded anticlines. I'll start with this one. This one is taken from just off the highway, but uh, 
you can see this is an overturned anticline. This is the up, this is the side that's more or less facing the right direction, and this is the overturned direction. We're going to actually go to an outcrop of the road when on this field trip. We which right along the road, we'll park the car, we'll go up, we'll walk. And unlike Big Ben, where you can't take hand samples, this outcrop, if you want to take a piece of this chert, it's white in color in that outcrop, you take a piece of chert. Uh, so it's, it's a highway right away. It, why are these things hogbacks? Why do these things, when they're eroded, remember this bed once went all the way over the cliff, probably, all the way over the hill. This is a dissected anticline, if you will. Why did this, why did this happen? It's because hogbacks, the rock is so hard and tough that joints in the rock are the only place you can get good erosion. And so these hogbacks are where you had a, a sheet, if you will, that is dipping eastward, southeastward here. And through time, little well, flash floods mostly have washed through these and eroded them away. I put this here, this picture for those watching and gonna go back and look for these slides because the highway department in an outcrop, I'm sorry, roadside rest about three or four miles away from where we'll stop and get a sample. They talk about how this area is the only place in the United States where you find the Appalachians and then the Rocky Mountains thrust over them. Here's a hand sample from uh, in the trail, it's float. Uh, Novaculite is microclistulline diatoms and radiolarians. And you can put that right there. And uh, once again, it's only deposited in very unusual conditions. It's always one of the few uh, environmental indicators that you can be absolutely certain because today, this stuff is still being deposited in the Pacific Ocean below the carbonate compensated ocean depth. So below 8,000 feet. I have a funny feeling that in Paleozoic seas, it may not have been that deep, but you can see it today. It forms as a as a, it, as little tiny skeletons, silicate skeletons of diatoms and radiolarians that are floating around in the, the daylight area up around 300 feet in the shower, uh, they live and they die and they, the skeletons fall all the way down to the bottom. And all, in the, between Hawaii and uh, North America, that ocean bottom is 12,000 feet deep. It accumulates. There's a little iron that uh, attaches to some of those. There's iron staining. It's called diatomaceous ooze, and it's kind of a brownish color. It's going on today. But that's too deep for calcite because all the majority of plankton are calcium skeleton type plankton, but calcium dissolves in ocean water slowly. And at 8,000 feet depth today, it's all dissolved. So all you can get is the silica skeletons. The other thing that's significant about this rock is there's not a lick of clastic. There's no clastic, no grains of clastic shale, there are no grains of uh, sand or no turbidites in this particular rock. There's no clastics in this. So subtract all that you could put into an ocean deposited rock. You subtract the clastics, you subtract the limestone uh, skeletons, you have an evacuate. This has a very specific place that is deposited deep in the ocean. If we look at the Maravillas formation, it's a chert also deposited in deep water. And we'll have a chance to see that Maravius up in the outcrop. It is bedded. We'll see it over our heads when we're walking on the trail. And in fact, here's a boot print. We'll walk all over it. What does this stuff look like? Well, Mother Nature tends to reproduce its phenomena the same phenomenon at different scales. So here's a piece of float in a trail that is one foot tall, and we can see chert beds in it. We can see some cleaner limestone. There's not that stain of iron in it. Got a little marl. Marl is 50% limestone, 50% chert. And then we've got a little shale in here too. That's like a 40% black chert, 10% white and rusted chert, 30% 
organic rich lime and marl and 14% shale that McBride described in 1970. In fact, he used the word fetid for organic rich, but uh, I'm gonna say uh, just still organic matter in it. Wait a minute, where's the black shirt? 40% of the formation is black shirt, where is it? Boing, here we go. Here's the black shirt. We see, uh, we see that this has also got very fine grains to it. It's got like to cavacula, like you could use this to grind a knife. It wouldn't be as effective as this guy. The navaculite is used to grind knives all over the United States, first by Native Americans before uh, other people arrived, and then since then by many people in Texas, Oklahoma, Arkansas, other places. This is fine grained enough as a shirt that you could also use it to grind knife, but uh, it's a little bit more variable. So people don't normally use the Maravillas to, to uh, sharpen their knives. Black. Why is it black? It's black because there's magnetite in it, magnetite stain. It was, the iron was there early at some point. Uh, it was turned to magnetite instead of just hematite. Mississippi and Tezis formation, we'll see it steeply dipping up here above the, the actually this is this is this is uh Tezis formation down here below the thrust fault, which put the orbition above it. This is Tezis formation. Tends to be kind of a slope former. It can get fairly broken up, faltered up, and uh, and here's a boulder of it that rolled down the hill. Why is this outcrop of the Tesnus uh, instructive? Because thrust folding occurs in uh, along long distances in planes of shale. Over long distances, you might have a thrust fault that stays within the same eight or ten inches of stratigraphic section. And before it decides to come up to the surface and break and, and come up and, and form the, the nearly vertical portions, it goes horizontally for a long distance through stuff just like this. We'll also have a chance to look at the Maravillas formation behind it, like I just showed you. But this is a very interesting formation because the properties of this rock are such that even though it was a hard rock in Pennsylvania time, it was already, this is a, uh, this is Mississippian, so it's already 40, 50 million years old. Still, you could pass a thrust fault through it. Why do we know it's Mississippian? Fossils. I think that's a brachiopod, but there's other people that know fossils better than me. We're going to look at the upper Cretaceous. We're going to step back for a minute, back to where we were in the last webinar in, uh, in uh, Santa Elena Canyon. We haven't seen this slide in the last webinar, but this particular slide shows us a view that's oblique such that the canyon is to the right and those cliffs of the Sierra Ponce are to the left. That's why there's a change in stuff. We looked last time at a, at a fall over here. This time we're just going to look at the stratigraphy of the upper Glen Rose below the Maxon sandstone. And we see that it's pretty limey. It's mostly lime at the top of the section in Big Bend, but there are a few shaley beds within it too. So, and it's also important that the Glen Rose formation has higher percentage lime towards the top of the formation. But remember, that darn thing makes a knuckle. And for those rocks to make a knuckle, and to, for those limestone beds to stay more or less as beds and not completely broken up, it's these shales in here that allow the shear that occurs when you take a bed like this and go like this. It allows those beds to stay competent. If it weren't for these little guys here, you'd have a hard time seeing anything uh, above the thrust plane in the percentage gap. How do we know it's Cretaceous? Well, once again, it's fossils, guys. My favorite fossil is always Exogyra, but you can also see fossils in the Cretaceous. These, this slide, uh, these pictures, they're from the Dinosaur Museum that we'll stop at just briefly on our field trip because it, once again, Oysters here, there's a there's a Inoceramus that's famous, Exogyrus famous in the Glen Rose, and also in the Bokeas formation. 
And so you'll also find this in uh, the, what's the name of that big play out there that people have been drilling in uh, in Texas? Let's go back, I guess, oh, this is the right thing. Here we go. Oh yeah, yeah, let's see. Where is it? It's equivalent to the Eagle Four. Your Bilkeus is equivalent to the Eagle Four. So you'll see this, but anyway, it's a it's an indication of a shallow shelf environment. Above that, we have the formation through which the Cretaceous thrust and precipitation gap occurred. The Penn formation it contains about 50% lime, 50% shale in marl beds. Also has a lot of mudstone, a lot of shale. So when it's eroding. It's a slope former, it doesn't form cliffs. It's a very low strength formation, so it bends very easily, it's ductile. Here it is, flat lying two miles from Santa Elena Canyon. Recall at the canyon, the 15 million, year old, 15 million year old normal fall brought these beds nearly straight up, about 60%, 60 degrees from horizontal due to fall drag. So it can be bent. It can be fractured, it can be sheared. You can put a thrust plane right through there. We're now going to leave Sundance and look at Butch Cassidy and start looking at the uh, start looking at the overturned anticline down here on this side. Uh, Persimmon Peaks right here. We're gonna come through, we're gonna come to a place to overlook right here with some ground level and then walk into the canyon itself. This is about four miles. This here is a, a two mile trail. It's not quite two miles as you look at it straight. All along the Santiago Mart Mountains. Look at that. There's the Glen Rose a normal position. Here it is underneath. Normal position. Here it is underneath with overturned beds. So if we have a knuckle, we have taken the entire joint off that knuckle. We're going to look more closely at this portion, the southeast portion of the mountains. Uh, once again, the Cretaceous glide plane through here. You'll see the we're not going to spend much time walking through the upper Cretaceous pen because we did over here the Aguja. We're going to concentrate on this stuff down here. And the trail from the trailhead runs through here. As we go to ground level, thanks to Google, it's now possible to do that. And I like Google because they say, well, as long as you tell them you got it from me, go ahead and use it for free. Permission granted. It's pretty easy to do. And so here we are looking Toward Persimmon Gap, three miles away from the trailhead, looking north 15 west. I'm going to rotate the camera, look north 15 east along that mountain range, Santiago Mountains. I'm going to rotate the camera again, north 60 east is that way. It's almost due east to the canyon itself. Well, we're a two mile trail there, we're at the trailhead. This is what it looks like without the geology superimposed. It's a lot more complicated with geology. Boing, here we are. Same, same views. I've just added the indications of the overturned anticline. The thrust fault still in red. One of the interesting things about this area is when you get close to Dog Canyon, you have Santa Elena Canyon form, Santa Elena formation, and it was put over thrusted over the Glen Rose at an earlier date than this thrust, than this big one that we see at Persimmon Gap. How do I know that? Real simple. Uh, the Santa Elena and Glen Rose get bent over in Dog Canyon in this overturned anticline. And southeast of Dog Canyon, Things change. We go from the San Diego Mountains into what we call in English the Dead Horse Mountains, the Cobias Muertos, and we see an overturned syncline right here, just south of Dog Canyon, and a regular over a regular incline over here 
uh, as well in this picture. So things get very complicated in the Dead Horse Mountains. It's a lot of strike slips, uh, st uh, geology. It's the most complicated geology in the park. We're gonna take a look at the canyon itself, canyon floors at 2,500 feet elevation. Uh, this little top of that cliff's at 28 and a half. Here's 3,000 feet. Here's a uh, correctly scaled, uh, three, there's 100 meters, 100 meters, 330 feet, 130 feet. We're gonna come up and we're gonna see this thrust ball in, here's Glen Rose over here. We're gonna see it in here the thrust ball, but we're also going to look at these rocks of the San Helena. This thrust fault occurred before the ones at Persimmon Gap got overturned below at Dog Canyon. While we're walking, thanks to San Helena, we couldn't see it uh, within our walking, except where it fell down in, uh, in the Rio Grande. But here it is upside down, overturned, in the uh, creek bed, Dog Canyon. And here's a piece of uh, Santa Elena, pretty good sized boulder. It's got uh, chert nodules on it, so we know that this side was the top of the surface. And remember, the one we saw in Santa Elena Canyon was a 600 foot tall piece of rock that fell over and landed on its uh, nearly upside down. Here, this is a smaller piece, but same theory rolls down from these cliffs. All right, we're gonna play a game of U or V. We're gonna look at the southeast wall of the Dog Canyon. These pictures were taken just in January this year. Here is a overturned, overturned piece of rock. Yeah, that's the south wall. Now, the, the, the funny thing that's hard to imagine, here's again, here it is again. It's upside down here. It's vertical here. It's normally section here. Upside down, vertical, normal section. Is this a U? I think so. Is this a U? I think so. Is this a U? Well, guys, when you get close, look, the thing is so, that anticline is so folded tightly over itself that it is a V in here, this older, this older rock. And of course, when your vertical rocks in the middle of the canyon down here, just around the bench here, well, I got to call that a U. Looking at the west side, the northwest side of the canyon, I think this is a little easier to see. It's a little easier to tell what's going on. We have a, get this guys. Let's call the Santa Elena Formation thrust over like a glove on your hand, all right? So we're looking at the glove on your hand and we're gonna erode away enough to take the knuckle off, take the, the glove itself off. Here we are, we're still in the end. I take the knuckle of the glove off, we're gonna erode all this away. So here's, here's the glove eroded away. It would have been the past before all this erosion, it would have been way out here close to the viewer because of this big old anticline. And then below that, we've got that finger of Glen Rose. So down here, there's a little piece left of the finger, and that's what's going on. Santa Elena formation, by our good luck, some somebody put a thrust fault through that before the main thrust fault made the Santa Con. And at this location, the thrust fault that we saw in Persimmon Gap so easily above the pen formation. It's all buried here below this uh, quaternary aluminum that's on the canyon floor. So once again, looking in the canyon, U or V, now the Northwest wall. This is upside down. It's part of a overturned anticline, huge anticline. This is upside down. It turns out they had 14 inches of snow in Big Bend a week before we got to this particular spot in the canyon. So there's a little bit of running water. This is normally bone dry, doesn't normally, except when you have a flash flood. So this texture on the bottom of the bed is not a primary sedimentary texture. It is a texture that's been partly sculpted by flash floods. Uh, that would be interesting as a primary texture, but it's had some help. 
Here we are. Is this a U or a V? Where all the V's and U's, they point toward the canyon and point northeast. Here we are looking at these rocks of Santa Elena formation within the wall of the canyon. Here we have another shot as we walk just a little further, we're walking southwest toward northeast in the canyon to see those. Definitely, definitely seeing uh, a very competent rock normally, a bed that Santa Elena, big blocky limestone, little thin shales in it allow these competent beds to stay bent but intact. We come to the we come to the uh, northwest along here. We get a better view of this exposed anticline. If you will, here's the glove on the fingers. We're looking the the fingers are the knuckle would be right toward me. The knuckles where I am are halfway to me from back here where the fingers are. We can see the overturned bed down here. We can see the uh, normally positioned bed, stratigraphically correct beds here. There's a little V there. Looking further, closer to Persimmon Gap, about halfway to Persimmon Gap. Another limestone bed in the Glen Rose, another one back here. These Vs point to, of course, the direction of, of uh, uh, it's not quite, no no anticline is is truly a flat surface. It always has a, or no, let me try that again. The, the crest of the anticline will either plunge or come up. These tell you that right here to the viewer, the anticline is kind of plunging into the rock just a little bit. So to summarize the outcrop very quickly, Persimmon Gap, we saw a Cretaceous thrust uh, fault causing an overture and anticline. I misspelled anticline, I apologize, in the hanging wall. From top to bottom, the hanging wall includes normal lower Cretaceous Glen Rose formation lying unconformably over Ordovician Maravius formation, thrusted over Mississippi Tesnus formation, lying unconformably over Devonian Cabias Novaculite, and then you've got the Maravius formation below that, unconformable below. There's no Silurian in the thrust foot wall, uh, in the Paleozoic thrust foot wall. And of course, we saw the pen formation in the foot wall of the Cretaceous thrust. Over Dog Canyon, we saw the overturned anticline, the hanging wall, lower Cretaceous Glen Rose, Cretaceous thrust fault of Permian Persimmon Gap is buried near the canyon. So the older Cretaceous thrust fault placed the lower Cretaceous Santa Elena formation over the Glen Rose formation, and the Santa Elena forms a northeast verging U or V into Dog Canyon itself because of being in that anticline. Turning to Bolivia, show me some seismic analogs. We're going to take you to a basin that I'm pretty familiar with. This is the Chaco Basin. It's a it uh, we have production in Bolivia in the Cretaceous, Carboniferous, and Devonian Silurian shown by color. We're going to take a look at three seismic areas, the New Poco field, which is a giant gas field, the Umberto Ross, the Umberto Suarez Roca field, which is an oil field, and we'll look at a, a near miss in El Dorado. It was a good oil show. We're going to take a look at this cross section across here that ran from uh, the eastern part of the Foreland Basin in Bolivia into the uh, into the uh, what do you call it? peripheral floor bulge. We're going to take a look at in this area. This, the source is, is for sure there. There's something like 150 TCF of gas already discovered in Bolivia, something huge. We're, but we, it's important that we look at the reservoir, the trap, the seal, and the migration and timing when we're looking at the seismic. Here's the cross section west to east, this little red bar here. We have a common depth below which you're mostly gas, above which you're mostly oil. So if you're producing from up here, you're making black oil. Now, within a kilometer of that line, you're making uh, wet gas, and then it's all gas well, below about a, uh, a kilometer below. Just to give you a scale, this 
line has a 10 to 1 vertical exaggeration because it's almost, it's like 250 kilometers long or something. So here's 25 kilometers, here's a one kilometer vertical. This is a 10 to 1 vertical exaggeration common for uh, recon seismic lines, which this was uh, from recon seismic lines shot in the 1970s. Remember in South America and in Europe, Pennsylvania plus Mississippian equals Carboniferous. That's what we use here. Looking at the Carboniferous in this part of the world, this was a slope fan region, and you'll see giant canyons cut into the Carboniferous through here. That's very important because if you have a convergence of really good channel deposits and structure, you will have really good wells out here. Bolivia exports a lot of gas. Typically, in a field like New Pulco, you can have an, uh, an, a potential of a quarter of a BCF per day if you hit the channel sand. You get a nice, huge uh, turbulent channel. Man, 30 or 40, 400 feet thick. Uh, it'll flow, like I say, a quarter BCF has been recorded out here for daily uh, calculated absolute open flows. However, on the same anticline, you can go uh, two kilometers away, one kilometer away, or gosh, guys, you know about these darn channel boundaries. You can go a half kilometer away, drill a hole that will test for two or three million cubic feet a day, one one hundredth, and they wouldn't even complete them back in a day. So this stratigraphy is very important. When they're drilling out here, they want to find a, a combination of thick channel sands and also some obvious structures. A little easier to see the stratigraphy on a 10 to 1 vertical exaggeration. But in fact, let me get that. I'll show you some more seismic at kind of exaggerations we normally interpret that. The Bolivian area, this is a, uh, a surface map. We're going to be in a foreland of Bolivia. And this orange circle represents these areas here. And so we've got uh, New Puco, a nice big gas field. We've got Umberto S. Roca here. We've got El Dorado here near Miss. Here's the line across the uh, fields, uh, New Puco and Chaco Sur here, uh, La Verziente back here. No, look, these next two anticlines have oil wells. On these maps, oil fields are in black and gas in red. But there's this gas here. So apparently some gas has come up here late and maybe displaced that oil. It's not that deep. Here's the two to one vertical exaggeration seismic line. It's a portion of the line across the uh, the Andino foreland here, the easternmost part. These faults, they look a lot like that, what we showed you in uh, near Marathon, Texas. Here's a nice little place where it rides flat on a bedding plane, lies flat on a bedding plane. Here it is at true scale, no vertical exaggeration. Thrust faults really are low angle faults. So this distance here, such that uh, at true scale, this is a 25, uh, this is a thir this is 32 mile distance, 51 kilometer distance on that line, true scale. Originally on a film like this, that's where we photographed it from. We'll look at Umberto S. Roca. Once again, a new discovery in this trend in 2015. One we'll look at, it's been around for a while. The thing about these boomerang hills northwest of the city of Santa Cruz, north verging thrust, back thrust, top seals, uh, big unconformity and shallow depth traps. This is important, it's all here because you just didn't get buried as deep. I know we're almost running out of time, so I'll just skip through this. Here's the producing formation. The field has made 12 million barrels primary production and uh, water after gas, water flood. Here's the original map. Here is the field structure. It made 12 million barrels primary out of half a square mile out of a rock. This uh, slur, this novaculite, the serre formation is also a novaculite, made a rock that has only 11% porosity. Half square mile, 12 million barrels, pretty impressive. Here's one however, that missed. And the reason is because in El Dorado, down here south of Santa Cruz, they had a, ch see that chimney, that migration chimney? This trap leaked. So we had great top seals here. We had uh, Cretaceous 
we had a Carboniferous, we even had a Silurian top seal. But here in this, this structure, the top seals were breached anymore. So to summarize real quick, in outcrops, we saw in persimmon gap, lots of details of the hanging wall, laramide, and uh, then all of the Southwest Virgin Santiago mountain thrust. And wrapped up in that hanging wall was a Paleozoic Northwest Virgin thrust. We saw the rocks described. We looked briefly at the upper pin uh, formation in the football to allow long distance thrusting over that foot wall, maybe uh, in, in Big Bend, those thrusts were maybe some of them eight, 10 miles. And the thrust faults need deep, weak ductile or plastic formation beds to place older rocks over younger. We have upper Cretaceous pen formation, Tesnus formation in Mississippi, both work. Over at Dog Canyon, we saw the overturned anticline. We saw the earlier Cretaceous fall that uh, thrust fault that placed lower Cretaceous over the Glen Rose like a glove and what happens when that bends around, weathering erosion, exposing different levels of anticline. We got all the way through the glove and into the knuckle in uh, the canyon and then tightly folded limestone brittle fractured in U's and V's of the anticlinal axis. Looking at Bolivia, that one to one, Thrust faulting geometry on seismic lines strongly resembles the same in outcrops. I showed you that if the seismic resolution is poor, guys, which is common in, in thrust fault terrains, you use outcrop analogs in your interpretation say, eh, it should look like this. Well, can it work like this? Will the data support that interpretation? Uh, I showed you two, day line, two D lines from uh, 40 years ago, but you can see newer data in 3D, and a lot of times they still look like outcrops. Brittle rocks in overthrust are often pressure connected over long distances. There's so many fractures that wells flow rates are often higher than from the same lithologies in normally faulted terrains. And even in thrusted and folded areas, stratigraphy still plays an important role, a factor of 100 on the same anticline in Bolivia. So, and finally, track top seals must be ductile or there's very risk that tops will, traps will leak. So be wary. Be sure of the source and reservoir, the trap volume and target zones. Top seals must be in place during the life of the trap. And deep burial often causes later gas charges to displace oil and reservoirs. So expect hydrocarbon migration across and along thrust faults. It does happen if the adjacent rocks are brittle. I'm going to show you the bibliographies here if you want to see it. And of course, we always show the last page, but I'm going to end my talk on this Dog Canyon at night. Once again, from the trailhead, taken by Richard Acosta. So thank you very much. We will see the Big Bend at night in our, talk, uh, in our trips as well. One of my favorite times in the park. What a great picture. So Here's thank you, Eric. We have a question from the audience on the, uh, in the Wachita Mountains of Arkansas and Oklahoma, the equivalent of the Caballeros is the Arkansas Noviculite. Is there yeah, also the same rock, the same older, part for yeah. well, let, let me finish the question. Is there, there is also an older Ordovician chert called the Big Fork Formation. Is there a litho lithologically similar formation to Ordovician age in the Marathons? Yes, and it is that Maravillas formation. Remember that black chert and that white chert? Okay, very good. So I, I think there was a question about the bibliography again. So um, the references um, are, are helpful. And also for those of you who have a, a registered to attend today's uh, webinar, you're going to receive a link to a recording of the webinar. So you can listen to it again. Um, perhaps you'd like to go back and, and look at some sections in more detail, including the references. You'll also receive an evaluation form and more information about the course that Eric teaches for SCA called the Big Bend Field Course. And of course, you can contact SCA's training department at training at scacompanies.com to schedule that field course. Uh, Eric's webinar today will be posted in our on-demand library, so it's available for future viewing. And a couple of times he referenced the last webinar he did for us on the uh, Santa Elena Canyon. And so consider these two companion webinars to give you more information about um, the Big Bend field trip. 
And I think that's all we have for our time with you today. So thank you so much for joining us. And uh, we appreci appreciate your participation. And we look forward to uh, seeing some of, you, some of you join the field trip for uh, the Big Bin sometime in the future. Goodbye. <laughs>